good afternoon, uh, everybody. I uh, hope uh, you can hear me at the back there. Yes. Okay, perfect. So today I will uh, speak on uh, net positive energy design, <coughs> which is a very dear topic to me uh, coming from Asia, which is uh, usually starved of energy, and uh, how we can actually make buildings uh, not only net zero energy, but then going the next step as to making it uh, run like a small mini power plant, actually feeding energy uh, back into the grid. So I will take you through uh, probably two uh, case studies, one with uh, kind of design strategies and the second uh, working uh, net positive energy building and how uh, we kind of achieved uh, this process of net positive energy itself. Uh, to start with, uh, if you see this uh, demographics of uh, the EU energy consumption, I mean this is data got out by the Eurostat, which is the official statistic uh, provider uh, for the European Union. Uh, one thing what you can see is the percentage of energy that buildings itself consumes in the European Union. If you see, uh, almost 37% of this energy uh, is consumed by residential and commercial buildings and the industrial buildings along with their processes almost consume about 30% of this energy. What this shows is that the buildings uh, almost consume about two-thirds of the total energy demand. And this is the reason <coughs> buildings have to be the focus uh, when we are looking at an energy demand reduction or energy efficiency uh, increase. <coughs> uh, coming to a typical building energy consumption itself, uh, if we look into the HVAC and the ventilation requirement, almost 70% of this or any typical building energy demand goes into running this system which is the HVAC and ventilation. Another 20% goes into lighting. So what we can say is only two factors of the building design, the HVAC and the lighting adds to almost about 80 to 90% of that building energy demand. So are there ways where we can kind of optimize these two processes because optimizing these two processes we are almost addressing 80 to 90 percent of a building's energy consumption. What could be the typical office building energy consumption? This is uh, statistics for buildings uh, across uh, India and I would say it's also kind of universal and if you look at office buildings, we stand somewhere between 250 to 300 kilowatt hour per square meter. This is a kind of a energy footprint of typical office buildings. If you translate that into a per meter square per month or, a, or the operational expense per employee of this office building on a monthly basis, you get to about 20 to 25 euros every month that any office typical office building would spend on its employee. We have high performance buildings with uh, ASHRAE 189.1 as a standard for high performance building design. Now there is a big shift in designing buildings to achieve high performance. So if you look at these buildings which have the same design for thermal comfort, the same kind of uh, occupants occupancy density and the same kind of a ventilation, the same kind of uh, probably lighting. The only, the only change being the way the building was designed or the, way, or the kind of systems that the building incorporated into its design to make it high performance, we could almost achieve buildings consuming energy of 70 to 100 kilowatt hour per square meter. What that translates into is about a 200% energy uh, increase in energy efficiency. So there are buildings, office spaces, which can be built at this low energy footprint. When it translates into an employee cost per square meter on a monthly basis, it comes down from 25 euros to about 5 euros a month. So these are some incentives which can be useful for even the operator or even the owner of the building in order to pursue such uh, buildings. There are always reasons that the capital expenditure on such buildings is a little higher. But then when we look at an ROI cost or a return on investment cost, which adds the capital cost as well as the operating cost, such buildings are always beneficial in the long run. 
But then we go to the next level of buildings. There are buildings which are designed nowadays and I think the future would be towards such buildings which are called the net zero energy buildings. Such buildings typically have an energy demand or a footprint of about 35 to 50 kilowatt hour per meter square. So a building which can be an office space working in the same conditions as a typical office space can still work at enhanced efficiency with such a low energy footprint. What is net zero energy? What it means is, I mean, in the definition sense, it's a building that doesn't consume any energy. Now, does that mean that the building actually does not consume any energy? No. What it means is that the building consumes energy and at the end of one year, the net consumption of that building in terms of energy is zero. That means the building produces energy on itself and when the production is higher than what the demand is, it probably stores that energy or feeds it back to the grid. And when the demand is lesser or, or when the demand is more than what is being generated, it probably taxed from that energy <coughs> source where it was fed earlier. So in effect, over an annual basis, the energy bill of that particular building is zero. So that is the meaning of net zero. And net positive means over a period of one year, the energy that is produced by that building is more than what the building consumed over a period of one year. So we will see one net positive building and uh, how we kind of achieve that. So when we look at a road to net zero energy, there are three things which are the major factors. One is the reduction in the energy demand itself in the first place. How you can actually come with a design which has the minimum energy requirement for that building. You can use passive design strategies, active design strategies, and so on. And second is to produce that EUI or the energy utilization index of that building per meter square on the building itself. You either connect that to the grid or to a storage system to save that energy for future need. If you look at some passive design strategies, this is one case study from Singapore, uh, which almost Singapore is known to have a wind velocity map as good as zero. So is there some natural wind movement that can be got in, in a place like Singapore? So this was a case study wherein there was, uh, uh, there was a building which, I mean, the, the circle that you see was the site and we had to create a building which is kind of these three blocks. Uh, these three blocks, the shape of it and the orientation was decided based on the built up area requirements of that building. But the central space between these three blocks, we thought it could be a collaborative space. The space for interactions, a space for a cafeteria. In Singapore, there is, uh, we have food courts, which is a very popular way of a restaurant. Uh, so can these food courts be naturally ventilated or can these food courts not have mechanical uh, ventilation, which is energy demanding? So we, look, we looked at different uh, criteria, one being the site itself. If we can induce some wind into that collaborative space on a natural basis or from a design perspective, so it can be naturally ventilated. Second, what we saw is what about facade angles? Can we play with facade angles in order to reduce the energy demand? This was the result. So we used about typically about five different options on facades, one being a straight facade and one being facades which are tilted towards the sun and the other being facades which are tilted uh, having a self shading. And what we saw from a straight facade to a facade which is having almost 15 degrees of inclination on self shading, we could reduce this energy demand by almost 40%. Now, when, you, when I say this energy demand, it is the demand which is used to reduce the solar insulation that is coming into the building. We have many buildings which are self-shaded, but the question is how much of an inclination a building should get. And that could be realized very effectively through a simulation process, like an energy simulation process in this case, and a daylight simulation process. What we saw was the energy dropped by almost 38.7% and 
but it had a collateral decrease in daylight of about 10%. So we could live with it, although. So it was a judicious decision to take a facade angle of about 15 degrees. Next, we wanted to see if roof angles play a role in this building design. We can have a straight roof or we can have inclined roof. Now when we have inclined roofs, what kind of an inclination we should have or what should be the angle of inclination. That is something that we decided to do a CFD simulation for this kind of an approach in order to decide what should be the inclination that we should achieve. If you see that round circle there, that's the space which is the central space of between these three buildings where we wanted to plan a collaborative or a cafeteria kind of a space. And we wanted natural air to ventilate that space. Now, of course, Singapore has a typical air temperature of about 30 to 32 degrees because it's in the tropics and on the coast. And year round, we have almost a similar kind of an air temperature. There's also an ASHRAE standards table which mentions that thermal comfort can be achieved at elevated air temperatures or operative temperatures if you have the air velocity which is going up. So we thought we need to achieve almost 1 meter per second air velocity uh, in comparison to about 0.25 or 0.5 meter per second air velocity in order to come into the ASHRAE thumb, comfort, uh, thumb, comfort zone. So when we did the CFD simulation, we saw that if you have an angle of inclination of the facade uh, or the roof, sorry, uh, to about 12 degrees, we can actually <coughs> induce the air into this space. The central picture here uh, shows this uh, dip in air, air velocity to about 1 meter per second. So having this design option, the architecture was decided to have a slab slanted roof for this building. We looked at green walls as uh, external or a secondary facade and also what kind of a density we need to achieve on these green walls. <coughs> so we looked at surface temperatures from 30 percent to about 70 to 80 percent and we saw that almost 70 percent of green wall uh, on the secondary skin could actually reduce my surface temperature on the exterior facade from about 30 degrees to about 27 degrees. So that's a straight 3 degrees drop in uh, surface temperature. So what we saw finally, we did some active design optimizations after the passive design was from the passive design optimizations of uh, probably air movement, self shading, uh, roof angles, facade angles, we could achieve almost 40% drop in our energy demand. On the active design side, there was another almost 40% drop in the energy demand. So what this shows is active design optimization is one way of reducing energy demand. But if you uh, collaborate that with a passive design, architectural design side, uh, which is uh, in, uh, running in tandem with simulations, you can actually achieve another 40% reduction in energy demand. Uh, three things. Mainly what uh, you need to be aware of when you select a glazing, I mean usually glazings are selected uh, probably looking at U values or even the color of the glazing or, or even the shape of the glazing. I mean architects usually like to do this. But other than the U value, there are two other parameters that needs to be looked into. U value of course looks at the uh, conduction coefficient of the glazing. We have glazings which are as low as uh, 1.2 to 1.5 watt per meter uh, square Kelvin. But the important part is looking at the full glazing system. We always or typically overrule the fact that the U value of the frame is never considered in the specifications. And frames usually tend to have higher U values rather than the glazing itself. We have glazing systems today available with U value as low as 1.8 on the whole system. The second is the radiation heat gain, which comes to SHGC or solar heat gain coefficient it is, as it is called. I think in Europe, it, the more popular terminology is the G value or in old terms, it was the shading coefficient of the glazing itself. This is another important factor that one needs to consider when you select a glazing requirement. 
and a low G value means there is less of heat coming into the building. I mean, there's a popular saying that when we use glass all over the place, probably in Asia, we also like to use glass nowadays in our designs, but the glass is used to let the light inside the building and the heat comes in for free with this light, which we don't want. So selecting a glazing with a low SHGC is something that needs to be looked into and written down in a specification. Next is the VLT or the visible <coughs> light transmittance. This gives the value for how much light or how much visible light is coming into the space. The range is between 0 and 1 which shows 1 is of course 100% of visible light that is available on the outer uh, glazing itself comes inside. But typically low E glazings and glazing with a low G value and a low U value has a VLT of about 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. Next plant efficiencies. This is the active system side and today we have plant efficiencies going low as low as 0 0.2 kilowatt per ton. In COPs, the plant efficiency can go as high as about 15 or 16 when you have a chiller which is running at elevated temperatures or, a, or having a higher thermal lift itself. So while our centrifugal and screw chillers in the past may have had COPs of about 6 or 7 or 8, the new chillers or the new uh, sophisticated or, the, or, or we can call it the maglev chillers, new technology can give us chiller <coughs> COPs at part loads to as high as 14 or 15 at higher temperatures. So we need to look at how, what kind of chiller we are choosing, what kind of uh, efficiencies or what kind of loading pattern we are trying to achieve on this chiller. Some other concepts which can be used is like an earth air tunnel. It is digging ground for about 20 feet and just laying pipes. The investment is the pipes and the fan which is running such a system where you have a DOAS kind of a system which is a dedicated outdoor air supply system. You take in the air through the fan, pass it through the ground, the ground being uh, a natural uh, heat exchanger where you can uh, infinite amount of energy can be uh, switched between the ground and the air <coughs> and pass that air back into the building. This kind of a system works uh, based on uh, different climatological uh, conditions so you cannot use this system uh, across all kinds of climates. In a hot and humid climate uh, like a Singapore climate this system may not work because the soil, the air, everything is at the same temperature. But in a hot and uh, in a hot climate, uh, probably a hot and dry climate, this system is very useful. Or we have something called a solar-based VAM cooling, which is kind of an absorption machine, working on the NH3 uh, principle. This was very popular in places which had waste heat. So if you have large gas uh, power plants or thermal power plants producing energy from coal, where there is a lot of waste heat available such systems would work very well. But now we have systems which can run these absorption machines uh, generating this heat or superheated steam almost at about 200 degrees Celsius to run the absorption machine. What is the advantage of such a system? You have an uh, absor absorption machine. It has a very low uh, COP. A triple effect absorption machine would have a COP of about 12 in comparison to a centrifugal chiller which has a COP of about 8. But the operational cost for running this machine is very low because you're generating steam right from solar heat. This kind of a system or uh, this kind of a design is becoming very popular in Asia because we have a lot of sun in the tropics and uh, we can actually bring down the chiller energy demand uh, quite substantially. The third part what I told you is to generate this power demand using photovoltaics. In the past, we have seen thin film photovoltaics, we have seen polycrystalline photovoltaics, monocrystalline photovoltaics, but the photovoltaic efficiencies went up to maximum of about 22%. And this kind of a photovoltaic, which is called the HCPV or the high concentrated photovoltaic, which could be the next thing in solar technology, can generate efficiencies of about 40%. That means 40% of the energy that is uh, on this uh, panel is converted into electrical uh, DC voltage or DC electricity. One reason 
uh, how it uh, changes is the construction of the uh, lens or the photovoltaic box itself which comes in from a Frenzel lens kind of concentrated uh, kind of a glass lens which is then concentrated onto a triple junction diode which produces three times the same electricity for the amount of uh, uh, light intensity which is uh, falling on that uh, particular diode. If it is coupled with again a dual axis tracker, so a tracker which is working on both planes, the XY plane and the XZ plane and which is coupled to a sun path for a particular uh, system, you can actually have this kind of a solar system going uh, or tracking the sun in effect. This is a chart, oops, this is a chart showing, okay. This is a chart showing uh, a sample production of solar energy itself through an HCPV panel. The green line showing the HCPV production at a particular day and the red line showing the normal uh, flat uh, plate collector photovoltaic which shows almost about 40% more energy that can be generated. Uh, what we have seen in a prototype study which uh, we have done in India is that a HCPV with a dual axis tracker when compared to a flat based uh, solar photovoltaic uh, collector generates almost one unit of power extra every day for a one kilowatt of solar installed capacity. So you can just imagine on a one megawatt scale if you, if, if you can generate one unit every day extra, that means I can generate one megawatt of power extra every day. And on an annual basis, it's almost 365,000 uh, kilowatt hour of uh, energy. Uh, going into one of the net positive energy buildings, this is a building uh, which was designed in uh, Bangalore in India. And uh, I just want to uh, take you through some of the strategies that was used. Uh, one strategy that was used was uh, walls which were about 200 mm thick, uh, porotherm blocks, uh, which were basically clay blocks uh, complemented by <coughs> a, uh, um, a kind of uh, a grid which was made from uh, uh, steel, uh, which was basically the walls. They had a U-value of 0 0.21 on the, on the walls itself. Uh, there was recycled concrete uh, or recycled steel that was used on this building with a GGBS kind of a mix which is grain granulated uh, uh, mix which replaced sand in the concrete itself and an overdeck insulation from XPS had a U value of 0 0.15 watt per meter Kelvin. There was high performance glazing that was used with a U value of the glazing system at 1.8 uh, and an SHGC of 0 0.21 and a visible light of about 0 0.6. Uh, on the lighting, almost 90% of the space had visual views to the outside and 75% of interior space had lux levels which were more than 300 lux. LED lighting was used on the whole building with a efficacy or uh, lighting efficacy of almost 100 lumens per watt. Now you get almost 120 or I think I saw one paper outside which said 140 lumens per watt. And lighting power densities which were used were almost 40% less than the uh, 90.1 standard. Task lighting was used and a PIR uh, kind of a lux level sensing was used in order to make sure that artificial light only comes on when the lux level from the or the lumens from the natural light drops below that particular threshold level. Uh, an earth air tunnel kind of a technology was used for free cooling. So air was passed through the ground and uh, into the space. Uh, the outlet temperatures were about 25.5 degrees in the summers and 24 degrees uh, in the winters as design conditions. The fans were VFD driven uh, EC fans and there was demand control ventilation uh, which was CO2 uh, monitored uh, for that building. 35% more fresh air was given into this building compared to the ASHRAE 60.2.1 uh, standard and the underfloor air distribution system which was used to push this air into the building was modeled on a CFD model in order to have a uniform uh, thermal map in the occupied space. So when we come to energy, the base energy consumption of this building was uh, this is operational data was seen to be about 46,741 kilowatt hour per square meter or, or per on a yearly basis. So it's 46,741 units of electricity per year. 
what we saw as a reduction from the earth air tunnel or the free cooling concept was almost a 10% reduction on this energy load. So my final energy consumption uh, which the building produ uh, consumed at the end of one year was less than 42,000. So what I saw as an energy consumption index or the EUI as what I showed you on the previous slide as a commercial building was down to almost about 36 or uh, 37.65 in this case uh, units per meter square per year. So we had a building which could operate in the same condition. It had air conditioning, it has lighting, it had everything as a normal commercial building but was operating at a very low energy demand. Then the question was to produce this energy. So solar modules of 28 kilowatt was used. It was a BIPV kind of a module, which was a building integrated photovoltaic. So photovoltaic panels or uh, so, uh, films sandwiched between glazing, 300 light hours. And on the worst case scenario, about five hours per day as uh, sunlight was used. And we almost uh, generated, so we generated almost 42,000 kilowatt hour of units per year. So our generation on this one year was more than what we consumed. So that uh, actually constituted this building to be a net positive uh, energy building. So such buildings can be built. One is to reduce this energy demand and then whatever minimum energy demand that the building may have can be easily generated on site. So that is what I had uh, for you. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I can take it.